Before we get this kicked off, um, I, I don't know if this will make it into the podcast or not, but I was talking to Lari the other day uh, while I was doing my research and shit, and I was, and I was like, dang, it's fucking cool, because when we were young bucks, we would... We, my, when we were young bucks, my mom obviously made us read the Bible front to back. Every day. Yeah, front to back. So we read it when we were young bucks. And all that was because it was more like a chore. At, at least for me, it was more of a chore. That was just like, it was just, I was just getting information. Mm-hmm. And then I went to a religious cycle. Like I was, I was, I was a devout Catholic. And, and, and that information then turned to like actually being spiritually in tune with the bible and 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 spiritually believing in it and then when my faith broke and now coming making a full circle now i'm looking at from a like a more of a scientific point of view more of an actual events point of view and it's pretty cool that but that's isn't that what faith isn't about though correct faith and that's why i'm i'm currently i my my faith is currently broken but i'm just saying that like that i've I've the the way that I've studied the Bible is in three is in three ways. When I was a young buck, it was just information, mm. getting information. It was a chore, and then when I was uh, a devoted like, like when I was going through my confirmation and stuff, like, and when I was devoted to my faith, I was spiritually and in tune with the Bible with with faith, and now I'm in tune with the Bible with with more reality and science and all this stuff, and it, it it's cool because these three parts fit perfectly together in a way well, it, because you, i because i know what faith is i know what the holy spirit is now i call it something different but but like it's cool that i know what it is what it was and like now that that i'm figuring my shit out it's it's like reading the bible or learning or studying the bible it's it's it currently serves a different narrative but it like I still understand like what these people go through in these stories and like what their faith is and all this stuff. And it was pretty cool. Like how all this learning just comes full circle. Well, I think the best part of it is that you kind of don't look at it as a closed minded way, you know, Mm -hmm. not saying that people that just fully devote and they're faithful that they're ignorant or closed minded. I'm not saying that, but I mean, I kind of am saying that, but sometimes you got to look at, like I said, both sides and you doing that full circle almost does that or it does do that. Yeah, it does do that. So, and the same thing with me, same thing with me, obviously like it was a chore and now I'm reading it to understand it with a purpose, kind of mm-hmm. with a purpose. Uh, um, and like I said, I've always, I just don't, I just don't believe in the institution, but I do believe in God and uh, because I feel like it keeps you, you know, morally sane. And now I'm reading it for re like a recap, like, Hey, I know this is going to make me a better person. It's just, you know, let's all let's keep it open minded about it. Mm-hmm. And you know, when me and Jackie like reading it, she's always asking me all these questions and I'm just like, I don't have these answers and I'm yeah. pretty sure nobody does. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so it's like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, not only do, people have the answer to the bible but it's really a book of spiritualness not a book of facts i mean a lot of the things in the bible are proven facts and a lot of them with scholars and and people that do their research it's it's uh, just they're just stories to them but it's a religious book and you have to look at it through a diff a variety of different lenses to truly understand what the what the message is being said but yeah i i I just find it really cool how how all that works out and all that all the all that experience is now being translated into intellects which is also pretty cool but episode zero zero six the ark of the covenant let's fucking go topic a topic go ahead i brought my bible to hopefully you give me some verses Mm -hmm. and uh i'll pull it up yeah um a topic that i've been interested 
for a very, very long time. Um, Exodus is was actually one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. And the story surrounding the book of Exodus and the story surrounding the Ark of the Covenant is one of the most interesting in in my point of view from the Bible. Um, no intro for this one, but <clears throat> I kind of just wanted to say that first of all, um, I'm not, we're not going to talk about the Bible, um, in like, we're not going to represent it. We're just going to look at it from a story point of view. Um, and I'm going to get a lot of things wrong when I refer to the Bible and maybe within the stories, because I'm just getting the, the, the big points, the, the more important points to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to translate it word for word for what the stories go. And so now that out of the way, and then also the Bible is probably the most important book that has ever existed and that has that will probably ever exist you know a lot of the things in the bible are true a lot of them are stories not only is a entire faith and religion revolved around this book but this book in a way has has created the world that we live in today um the, the other thing the other day i think i seen the most important the most in people the most important men in the world that have transformed that have transformed history or the world as we know it. And at the top is Jesus Christ. He's the most important man that has that. What our modern day of life is, is in partly thanks to his teachings. And the second was, I don't know. I think it was, um, Napoleon. I think, I think it was Julius Caesar. I think Julius Caesar is the second most important man in history. And I think he's responsible in part to how the world is and what it is now. Modern civilization, of course. <clears throat> yeah, modern civilization or civilization as we know it. But but yeah, it's it's a very important book. And yeah. So let's dive into the Ark of the Covenant. Now we're gonna cover we're gonna cover the Ark of the Covenant in three phases. Phase one, the backstory to how the Ark of the Covenant was created. Uh, phase two, what the Ark of the Covenant is. And phase three, where could it be? Oh. So, <clears throat> um, Let's go. yeah. So, I'm going to go through kind of uh, the beginnings of ex of the book of Exodus. So, before the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. Do you do you remember what, what that was by any chance? Uh, no, that's why I, I'm reading well that's why we're reading the bible right now because you know i want to be familiar with mm -hmm. a lot of things okay so no all right so uh so i i i went through the bible again and i read the book of exodus again and i took some notes and kind of a little story from the bible of the events leading up to the ark of the covenant so we're going to go into a little story mode here so this story begins in Egypt. At this time in Egypt, there's a Pharaoh who fears the growing numbers of the Hebrews. And with a paranoid thought, he thinks that one day the Hebrews will revolt and overthrow the kingship. So the Pharaoh enslaves the Hebrews and forces them to work long hours in the field, as well as the making of mud bricks and other labor intensive jobs. The Pharaoh also bestows taskmasters to punish the Hebrews if they do not meet the quotas. But no matter how much pain the Pharaoh inflicts on the Hebrews, they persist and continue to prosper. Now, uh, through this story, I'm going to refer to the Hebrew people and the Israelites as the same. The, the, yeah. the Hebrew people is the current people here. And Israel or the Israelites is their community, is their faith. It's their prophecy. It's mm -hmm. what they will fulfill to mm -hmm. be. And in the Bible, God refers to the Hebrew people as the, the Israelites, his Israelite people. So the Pharaoh does not like this outcome, of course, of the Hebrews prospering. And he calls for the death of every newborn Hebrew boy. The newborn, the newborn girls are allowed to live. And during the time of this purge, there is a Hebrew woman who conceives a boy. 
and instead of giving him up to be killed by the Pharaoh's army, she puts the boy in a basket of twigs and sets him down in the river, handing his life over to fate. Now, call it fate, call it luck, or call it the will of God, but at the time the boy was making his way down the river, the Pharaoh's daughter, the very same Pharaoh that called for the death of every Hebrew newborn boy, was at the riverside washing herself and finds the basket with the boy in it. She decides to make the boy her son, names him Moses. So now time passes now and Moses is now a man of Egyptian royalty. And during this time, Moses came to know that he's not Egyptian. He's a Hebrew and he has, and he doesn't have Egyptian blood in him, but that of the Hebrews. And he sees how his people are being mistreated. And the sight of this, of course, does not sit well with him. And as he's witnessing the suffering of his people, he sees a taskmaster, the Egyptian taskmasters that hurt the Hebrews. He sees a taskmaster abusing one of the Hebrews. And out of anger, Moses strikes the taskmaster, killing him. Frightened for the crime he has just committed, Moses buries the Egyptian in the sand and now frightened for his own life, he flees Egypt to a land called Midian. With me so far? Yep. Now, we're going to take an enormous time jump here, but I'm going to still cover the main, po- the main points that happen in this timeline. And so in short, in the land of Midian, Moses takes himself a wife by the name of Sephira, and they have a son by the name of Gershom. In this land, God reaches out to Moses via the burning bush and instructs him on how to liberate the children of Israel, the Hebrews, from the bondage of the Egyptians or from being slaves to the Egypts. Moses follows God's instructions and goes back to Egypt with his staff in which God has, in which God has filled with his powers. Uh, now, quick note, Moses God didn't just reach out to Moses and was like, hey, go liberate my people. And Moses was like, let's go. Uh, He had a little bit of resistance. He was like, why me? Mm -hmm. Why choose me? There's other people there in the world that can help you. But nevertheless, Moses was chosen. So while in Egypt, Moses reunites with his people and his brother Aaron. And a series of back and forth conflicts between the Pharaoh and the Hebrews will ensue after the Pharaoh denies the freedom of the Hebrew people. And these conflicts will be known to us as the 10 plagues of Egypt. After one plague comes down by the hand of God to smite the Egyptians, the Pharaoh retaliates and punishes the Hebrews even more. And the 10 plagues are the turning of water to blood, the infestation of frogs, lice or gnats, wild animals or flies, the pestilence of livestock boils, a thunderstorm of hail and fire, uh, infestation of locusts, three days of darkness, and the death of the firstborn son. Now, the last, pe- the last plague, the death of the firstborn son, was the final blow to the Egyptians. After this, the Pharaoh let the Israelites go, and go they did. Once the Israelites left Egypt, they made way towards the Red Sea and rested and rested. Now, back in Egypt, the Pharaoh and his people were, were furious of what had happened and questioned why did they let the Israelites go. So they gathered their army and made way towards the Red Sea to enslave the Hebrews once again. Now, in the Bible, it says that the Pharaoh gathered 600 chariots to pursue the Israelites. You know what chariot is? Is it like a, a like chariot a, with horses? With horse, yeah. yeah. 600 of them to fucking go after these people. Now, so the Egyptian army catches up to the Israelites and by the will and instruction of God, Moses parts the Red Sea in two, giving way for the Israelites to escape. Once the last of the Hebrew people crossed the sea, Moses closed the path, killing all of the Pharaoh's army. There was no survivors. Now the Israelites are free. And God instructs Moses to climb Mount Sinai where he will be given the Ten Commandments for his people to obey, as well as the instruction to construct the Ark of the Covenant to house the tablets in. 
All right, so that was a quick background story, and that was all of the events. That was pretty much all of the events leading up to the creation of the Ark of the Covenant. And it's important to note that the children of Israel, the Hebrew people, they suffered in Egypt for 430 years. So they were slaves for 430 years before Moses and God liberated them. You with me so far? Yeah. That, that was pretty much the backstory, though. Which back in the day, 400 years, didn't they live uh, supposedly, you know, like 700 years, 900 years, 400 that was, years, um, 500 years? Those dates are much earlier in the Bible, like with, I think with Noah, um, a mm. book that's banned from the Bible, uh, the book of Enoch, another topic. That, mm -hmm. that, 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 that's going to have a podcast by itself. <clears throat> but that's, that was earlier. That was earlier in in the Bible's history. Um, however, Moses, I think, lived to like one twenty or one forty, something oh, like that. Okay. okay, something like that. So, no, not in not in this time mm -hmm. frame. But, but yeah, um, so yeah, so Moses Moses climbs Mount Sinai. Oh, you know what? I actually have a good picture representing what it would have looked like when God came to his people and I can pull this up this is the the stories the the stories in the this story in the Bible is shows that when God when the Israelites and Moses arrived to Mount Sinai there was a cloud surrounding the top of it with lightning striking and like this thunderstorm this rumbling with because God's presence was at the top of this mountain mm -hmm. and nobody was allowed to go to the top of the mountain except Moses to to talk to him but it's they're very fascinating stories to say the least now now we get to the ark of the covenant now we but you're good with the backstory and the story leading up yes. to it? Any yep. questions? Yep. No. All right. So now we get to the Ark of the Covenant. And as Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai, of Mount Sinai, God gives him the Ten Commandments. So Moses did not inscribe them. Moses didn't write the Ten Commandments. God gives it to him. And he tells Moses... And he gives Moses instructions on how to construct the Ark of the Covenant. The Covenant meaning the covenant between God and his people, the Israelites. In the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant is referred to as the Ark of the Testimony. And there is exact dimensions on to how the Ark of the Covenant looks like. Okay. And I'm going to read him. Uh, you can find him in Exodus 10, I think, in your Bible. Verse 10 through... Oh, sorry. Exodus 25, verse 10 through the 21st. <clears throat> but it goes, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half their breadth of thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be on the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark. These staves meaning rods or poles of wood. Mm -hmm. So the construction of the ark is all wood. It's believed that it's acacia wood, one of the most, one of the more durable woods that there is out there. And it's all covered with gold. That the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark and they shall not be taken from it. And thou shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee, meaning the Ten Commandments. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, 
two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half their breadth of. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. A cherubim is, I'll, I'll pull up pictures here later once I'm done with these verses. But a cherubim is a type of angel. I'm not sure if you knew, but there was there's more than one type of angel. No. There's the most popular that I'm sure you know of are the archangels. Those were pretty much the warriors of God. Um, there's cherubim. Oh, like archangels? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, there's cherubims. There's... There's, uh, there's, I, I, I don't know the name of all of them, but there's a bunch of different types of, an, of, of angels, and some of them are, are pretty crazy looking too. So two cherubims of gold of beaten work shall thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherubim on the one end and the other cherubim on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubim. On the two ends thereof, and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another towards the mercy seat. Shall the faces of the cherubim be, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Again, Exodus twenty-five verses ten through the twenty-first. Let me pull some pictures so you can see what, what God. Did you say? I was like, does it? Do they, do they have an illustration? Uh, in the Bible? No, not in the Bible, but uh, like, did well, anyone just? Yes. Yes, this is the Ark of the Covenant here. All of this was made of wood, uh, again from acacia wood, and it was all overlaid with gold on the inside and outside. It's but what a beauty. Yeah, I think so. The I mean, I I probably missed it when I was when I was trying to look for this, but um, God instructed Moses to build this, right? Yes, he okay. exact dimensions. What I just okay. described, perfect. These cubits, dang, I think I wrote it somewhere what these cubits are. But the ark is believed to be about like four four by three, about four feet by three feet. So a big box of of wood and and gold. I gotta sneeze. Never mind, no, I don't. And gold. And it's and since it had the stone tablets and all the gold and all the wood, I think um scholars estimate it to weigh around five hundred pounds or so. But yes, this is it. And how, these are and how much pounds? Uh, around four to five hundred pounds. Okay. That's pretty heavy. Yeah, with all the solid gold works yeah, and the really wood and sense. everything filled. So here we have the ark itself, the rings described, the poles going through the rings. And those poles are for like people to carry it? Yes. Okay. God also gives instructions on how to specifically carry it. We'll go through it here a little bit later. Uh, the cherubim, which are the type of angels. In this illustration, it shows like what a typical uh, angel would look like. But that is not how a cherubim looks like. I'll mm -hmm. pull up a picture of that later. And then the crown surrounding the mercy seat. Keep this in mind. I'm going to bring this up later. So this is a crown surrounding the mercy seat. A crown, okay. Yes, a crown okay. surrounding mercy seat. Okay. Uh, mercy seat, say that again. No, mercy seat. Yeah. Uh, so what, this. What is mercy seat? What a mercy seat is, is a little platform on top of the lid of okay. the ark. It's It's... It makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I get what you're trying to say. Yeah, I'll pull it up. I'll describe it later. But here's another illustration of it. Oh, what is the same one? <gasps> what? I think I screenshotted the same picture twice. What a goofball. So uh, does God instruct what to do with it? Obviously, I'll get into it when I'm there, but I'm... Almost there on Exodus. So he or does. Or what was, does it describe what? What was he used for? What's the purpose of it? Yeah, so the purpose of the Ark of the Covenant is to carry the. Yeah, no, for, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, which this, is. This which is to describe what he's going to, like how he's going to use it or, you know, buddy. for what? 
You gotta slow the fuck down, buddy. Well, I don't know if you're getting to this, so I just want to ask. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll get to it, man. But let me just fucking. I'm trying to look just at. Ask, just to make sure. Dude, there was a. Check. There was a good ass picture of. What's a month? Nah, bro. I'm already. So cracked out on caffeine, bro. Yeah, look at this good mate though. This is probably the be- one of the best mates I've made. I know. All right, boys. New model, bro. I can't. I can't find that picture. Sorry, guys. I'll still put it up. So I'll still put it up. All right, just so they can. So yes, um, the last verse, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark, thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. So the Ten Commandments. Again, mm-hmm. Moses did not write these Ten Commandments in stone. God gives it to Moses. So Moses was also given instructions to construct a tabernacle to house the ark. And a tabernacle is a meeting of place or worship. It was a fenced in area. And within this fenced in area was the tabernacle and within the tabernacle was the ark. And yes, I do have a picture of that. <laughs> you this. better have pictures. Yeah. So this is the fenced in area. This right here is the tabernacle in the tabernacle. In this picture, in this illustration, I think that's the ark. But the ark is supposed to be in, in the, the tabernacle, tabernacle. And this is supposed to be the presence of God. Now... God gives Moses specific instructions on how to transport the ark and who can transport the ark, Hmm. which are only selected priests from the Levites tribe, which are descendants was, which are descendants of Aaron, Aaron being the brother of Moses, the biological brother of Moses. So only people from the Levite tribe and only from the descendant of Aaron are the only those people can be selected to be priests and can be selected to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. And they also needed special clothing to wear so they can transport the Ark of the Covenant as well, which is pretty crazy. Here's a, another picture of the Ark and what the Levites need to be wearing. They, so they had to have these plates, breastplates of gold, of hammered gold, these head pieces as well and a specific type of robe as well and a specific color of robe as well purple i think like this they had to have this guy's attire and all this is in the bible as well that you guys can look up but does uh um i was gonna say um, i forgot i forgot god damn it bobby so yes, um, now the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony. Oh, okay. okay. Hold on one second, one second. Now nah, it just came back. Does it um, <clears throat> does it talk about how they got all this gold and and all these materials to build it, or do we have it? If, you know? if if they did talk about it, I can't can't comprehend it. I'll get. I, I can't pop okay. it up on the fly, but oh. Because, I mean, it is a lot of expensive material to just, you know, did, did Moses have money? Like, you know, did you, you get where I'm kind of coming from? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get what you're kind of saying. That's why I'm just like, I mean, this shit, I mean. No, so, well, actually, um, now that we're kind of on that topic about the people and all that stuff, um, I, I, it, I can't, it doesn't come to mind of how they got all this material, well, the acacia wood is a prominent wood found in the region. For sure, for sure. The gold, I'm not sure. But it's however, more about the gold and stuff. How, however, and how they built it too. Yeah. How, however, um, well, the guy that built it actually has a name that I forgot. There, but there's a guy that actually built the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible. I think his name starts with a B, and Moses gives him the instructions that God gave him, mm. and that's when it's constructed. So it wasn't Moses that built it then. I don't believe so. No. Okay. But while we're on the topic, so once the people were, once the people were liberated from, from the Egyptian slaveries mm-hmm. and they crossed the river, which. The Red Sea. Yeah. They crossed the Red Sea. Sorry. 
which would be this. Uh, the, I think I just popped this up on maps, but this is where the Egyptian kingdom would be. The Giza is around this area. They would have made their way towards the red. This is the Red Sea here. Somewhere along this side, Moses would have part and parted the sea and then went to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is right here. There is some people that think Moses did not climb this mountain. He climbed another mountain uh -huh. where God's presence was at, but that's a topic for another discussion. And then when Moses came down, so he was on the mountain for 40 days. And then I think he even had to go up the mountain again for another 40 days. And when he, but when he came down, his people were worshiping um, a bronze calf or like they were worshiping a cow or something like that. Of course, <laughs> of course, this did not sit well with, yeah, of course, this did not sit well with God or Moses. And to punish the Israelites for um, their, infidel their infidelity, he punished them to 40 years of wandering the deserts, 40 years to reach the promised uh, land. So, and which the they, promised land being Israel, the promised land being Jerusalem, yes, which would be somewhere in this area. They, they wandered in circles somewhere in this area, just walking around, just trying to find, uh, trying to find the promised oh land. Gosh. Yes, well, I unfortunately, they didn't have Google Maps back then. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, the Ark of the Covenant itself housed the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments as well as Aaron's rod. And now, backstory here a little bit. Remember me mentioning Moses left Midian with his staff? Mm -hmm. Now, Moses asked God, how the fuck are the elders of the Hebrews going to believe me? Going to risk everything? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're going to think I'm crazy. So God told him, take your staff and throw it on the ground. He, he took his staff, threw it on the ground, and it turned into a snake. He told Moses to perform the same miracle against to the elders so they can see that it is that I am truly with you. And so he did that, and that's why the Hebrews followed Moses. Now, God also instructed Moses and his brother Aaron to go and ask of and ask the Pharaoh to to liberate him and his people. And and the Pharaoh said, well, why would I do that? You know, we got gods of our own. We have gods to worship. My gods are more powerful than your God. So they went into a little contest. And this was the first contest. And this is where the, this isn't the, this isn't part of the 10 plagues. But after this, the 10 plagues ensue. So, so the contest was the, the same miracle, throwing the staff down and a snakes and the staff would convert into a snake. Now the Pharaoh had magicians and or magician priest. The Pharaoh had his own priest, which were magicians. They performed the same miracle. However, the staff of Aaron and Moses' staff ate the other two snakes that the mm. that they converted. And then a bunch of back and forth miracles and plagues will ensue after this. So Aaron's rod is is uh, believed to also be in this Ark of the Covenant, as well as a paw of mana, of, of, of mana or, or, or mana, some, something like that. Now, what this is, is again, as I mentioned to you, the people um, were punished with 40 years in the desert. And throughout this time, they didn't have anything to eat or drink. So obviously all these people were, the Israelites were murmuring and were like, well, what the fuck? Why would, why did we leave what we had? Even if it was fucked up, you know, at least we weren't hungry. So God gifts them mana for them to harvest from the land. It, the mana is directly from, from God's realm and he gives them to harvest. Yeah, that'd be cool. He, he gives them to harvest Sunday through, uh, Sunday through Friday and I think on Friday they have to harvest for Saturday because the, yeah, because yeah. of the Sabbath, and God didn't give. Which them. you know we're in Sabbath right now. Hmm? We're in Sabbath right now. Oh, are we? Yeah. I just know because B and H. Oh. I can't. I can't check out anything because we're under Sabbath. Oh, I I did not know, but because of the Sabbath, uh, of course, God's resting day, 
uh, of course, God's resting day, which a quick note, um, do you know why Catholics rest on the Sunday instead of Saturday? I do not. Nope. I like so, I said. so there is this, of course, back and forth conflict between all of Christianity, you know, who's the right is religion. It, wait, wait, sorry. Sorry. Is it Sabbath or Shabbat? The Sabbath. What was it? Shabbat. I don't know what that is, mm. but anywho, yeah, sorry. So, so the reason why Catholics, so of course, most of other Christian religions rest on the Saturday because that is God's resting day. However, Catholics rest on the Sunday and have mass on Sunday because Jesus was crucified on Friday, died on Saturday and resurrected on Sunday. Okay. So they worship Jesus and God on his resurrection day, which was Sunday. Okay. I think might be wrong, <laughs> dude. I don't want to get a lot of things wrong because this, the, you know, the, reli- you know, I'll get bashed on, but as I said, I'm, I think it is. I think it is, man. Um, maybe this is how you s- Maybe you say it wrong, but isn't isn't this his Sabbath? Oh yeah, it is. Like Shabbat or or the Sabbath, also called Shabbos, um, is Judaism's day of rest on the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Mm-hmm. On this day, religious Jews remember the biblical stories describing the creation of the heaven and earth in six days and the redemption from slavery of the Exodus from Egypt, mm-hmm. and look forward to the future messianic age since the jews religious calendar counts days from sunset to sunset shabbat i'm probably mispronouncing this shabbat begins in the evening of what on the civil calendar is friday so Mm. it is but it's the same thing that i was Mm. interesting interesting so yes and mana uh the food that god gives the israelites while they're wandering the desert and a jar of this was also housed in the Ark of the Covenant. Do we know what Mana is? We don't have it. Again, it yeah, was. Yeah, it would be yeah. in the Ark of the Covenant, but do we know it was like wheat or something? You no, know, like some, um, I think. And that'd be cool if uh, uh, what comes from God's kingdom, how you, how you said that'd be. Mm-hmm. I wonder what it is. Yeah. What, what, um, is, what, what is it? I think I came across something that it was something similar to honey or sweet milk, mm. something along those lines. But it filled, it kept the uh, Israelites from for going for 30 years. fucking years in the fucking desert. And another quick note during their wandering of the wilderness, of course, they didn't have food, water. And if I'm remembering the story correctly, there was one day that they did not harvest enough uh, manna for their survival. And of course, they didn't harvest enough because the people were getting too comfortable. And they were getting, and so since they didn't harvest it, they were getting hungry and thirsty. And so Moses being stressed and, you know, trying to. Yeah, all that to, pressure. All that pressure, he performs a miracle without God's consent and he strikes a rock and the rock burst out water from within the rock and water to give uh to quench the Israelites thirst because Moses did not ask for God's request and he didn't say it in God's name God or sorry Moses was was punished by never reaching the promised land <sighs> Dang. So all all this hard work from oh, Moses, yeah, yeah, his yeah, negligence yeah. uh caused him to never reach the promise. How did he perform it? You can perform miracles or whatever back in the day cuz Well, th- remember, Moses is God. Well, first of all, Moses So he kind of got like this like for 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 the Jews, Moses is probably their greatest prophet. It's he's the liber- he's the, the liberator. liberator. Yeah. Liberator. So so Moses Actually, I think between Muslims and Christianity, Moses is revered as one of the greatest prophets. Of course, um, the Muslims, you know, before Muhammad, Muhammad is their 
the main the main one. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Christianity to Jesus is the greatest prophet, yep. but he's one of the greatest prophets in the stories. And so he's already performed all these miracles, and he had you know kind his like, staff and everything, and God gave him the ability to perform miracles. Okay. However, in this in this instance, he, he didn't, didn't do it in the name of God. He just mm. he just gave him water without saying in the name of God. I'm, I, and with him and with his power, he gives us this and ba- and bashes the rock, and then water comes out. He did it against God's um, consent against again. And because of this, he was, he his punishment was never reaching the promised land. Damn. Yeah, kind of fucked up. <laughs> I mean, but he, he's probably sitting next to God though, so he's good. Yeah, right. I mean, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So, which actually, you were named after Moses. I was. My you name were, is Moses, guys. I you was. You were named after Moses. Yeah. Mom told us that. Yeah. And I was named after Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Peter. What an asshole, bro. I denied Jesus. Yeah. But Peter was upon his name, the rock, something like. Of where, yeah. Of where Jesus Don't. will build his church upon. Peter was the mm-hmm. first. Um, I think Catholics believe that Peter was the first pope in a way, the first high priest mm-hmm. that would lead the Catholic church, the the, the first Roman Catholic church. Uh, oh, I didn't show you a cherubim, did I? I don't think so. Yeah, so again, a, this is a cherubim up here. This depicts it as being like a, 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 yeah. a regular angel. But cherubims are crazy looking, bro. This is what a cherubim would look like. With three faces. Actually, you know what? I uh, made a note here. In the book of Ezekiel... Of Ezekiel 1, 5 through 11, they're being described as having the likeness of a man and having four faces, that of a man, a lion on the right side, an ox on the left side, and an eagle. What is, yeah, and an eagle. Hmm. Crazy looking beings. Now, this is in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel is one of the craziest books in the Old Testament. It I'm not getting into it. But <laughs> but but in short wait, so so uh animal humanoid beings. Haven't we already talked about that? Animal humanoid beings, haven't we already talked about that? Do you mean we'll get into it. <laughs> like in the Anunnaki? Bro, yeah. Oh my god. I think this guy is from a Syrian um clay work something like that which again middle east anunnaki the sumerians and all this stuff which if you did not know pedro we're gonna get into origins of religion and origins of god and and are god's aliens and all this stuff but the these these books come from their abrahamic religions and if you didn't know abraham originates in the sumerian region abraham started off in in the Sumerian regions in Babylon and all these regions over here and then he migrated out of there so it's th- th- there's a mm. there's definitely a link between the stories and the the Sumerian tablets and the religious books such as all of them J- Judaism Christianity and Muslim because they're all Abrahamic religions and Abraham comes from the the fertile crescent that's dope uh, <clears throat> isn't that political treaty that it's called the uh, Abrahamic Accords? You think it's named after that? I don't know I much about know. that actually. It was basically like I think it was under Trump or something that they. Uh, that's why it was very peaceful in the Middle East when Trump was president, and mm. they named it the Abrahamic Accords. And I think we caught out of it. Or so I can't. I'm not gonna get this mm-hmm. shit wrong, but. But I was wondering if that was named after that. I'm not sure, but I can see because all these, the three biggest religions in the world are tied, are linked together because of Abraham and his sons. I'm going to see if I can, uh, hold up, hold up. I just want to see, I just want to see real quick. Mm -hmm. So this is just from Wikipedia, not saying it's 
right or wrong, whatever. But yeah, it's uh the context is but yeah, it's the Arab and Israel conflict. Um The Abraham Accords are the literal agreements on Arab Israel normalization signed between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain on September 15, 2020, mediated by the United States. The initial announcement of August 13, 2020 concerned only Israel and the United States or United Arab Emirates. Before the announcement of the follow up agreement between Israel and Bahrain on September 11, 2020, um on September 15, 2020, the official signing ceremony for the first iteration of the Abraham Accords was hosted by the Trump administration at the White House. Okay, so I may have it may have not just huh. Mm. It's it's deep. It's deep. It goes way deep, but yeah. It's I I I I was wondering if um it was named after that. It could have been. Yeah, it could have been because, again, these religions are tied through Abraham and Jews and Christianity are tied through Abraham, through Isaac, and um, and Islam or, or the Muslims are tied to Abraham through Ishmael. They're both sons mm. of Abraham. And they're both sons of Abraham. It's so uh, fascinating how all these... Uh, I... Some, I uh, I haven't watched, I haven't seen, but like there's actual people that like uh, get the family tree off yeah. of everyone. And then they're like, oh, this person is from this person and from that. It's pretty cool. All, all that things. And then it goes on to the, to the New Testament mm -hmm. on, you know, Jesus Christ. And then what, how is he related to whom and all this stuff? Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, well, that's basically what the Bible is. The Bible is basically a an, an gigantic family tree. Um, I think they're all linked together. They're all linked together. Uh, Jesus is apparently the descendant of King David. Of course, King David being the story of David and Goliath that I'm sure all of us have heard. And then later his son, uh, Solomon, uh, one of, a great king of Jerusalem. It's uh, Even if you're not religious, there it's an incredible book mm -hmm. to get into. Mm -hmm. Not only does it form a great foundation for living a healthy life but it's 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 a great book that's why i'm reading it mm -hmm. without any institution kind of involved in it you know mm -hmm. so what is the ark of the covenant and what does it do so the ark of the covenant not only houses the power of god in the form of the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, which were written by the hand of God, as well as Aaron's rod, in which God's power flow, uh, flowed through, allowing Aaron and Moses to create miracles, such as parting the Red Sea or the staff shifting into the snake, but as well as the jar of manna, which was the Hebrews' food source God gifted them. And of course, this food source comes from God's realm, from heaven, if you will. And so all these three things that are housed within the ark, not only is the ark basically created in the image of God, God tell, gives most the exact dimensions of what to create, but there's three holy relics within the ark of the covenant that are directly tied to God. God's, it has, it houses God's power, if you will. So what is the ark of the covenant? Well, one it houses the power of God. Two, it's a communication beacon. God speaks to his people through the ark as seen in Exodus 25 verses 22. And there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Like remember the mercy that mm -hmm. I told you to keep through in between that area upon the mercy in between the two cherubim, the two angels, God will speak to Moses and to his priest through there. And three, it's a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> now, and that does, does it say that 
in the Bible? It doesn't say what the Ark of the Covenant is, but we can definitely make the assumption based off of the scripture and based off of how the Ark is used. So again, we already know it houses the power yep. of God, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we already know it. God communicates to his people through the Ark, as the verse that I just read to you. And we know it's a weapon of mass destruction because in Joshua 6, so far, no, by this time God has, or Moses has now passed away and Joshua is the new prophet leading the Israelites into the promised land. God gives instruction to go around the walls of Jericho for six days, once every day. And on the seventh day, God commanded the city to be attacked by seven priests blowing trumpets at the same time. Joshua saying unto his people, and I quote from the Bible, shout for the Lord hath given you the city, end quote, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. The priest walked with the Ark of the Covenant six times around the walls of Jericho, and on the seventh day they blowed trumpets, shouting with by the power of God, holding the Ark of the Covenant, and the walls just crumbled down. Hmm. This is an example of showing that the Ark of the Covenant holds power of mass destruction. Now, I'll give you another example. There is in... Uh, oh, man. There was, um, there was a, a, a guy that part of the Levite tribe that he, he was one of the sons of the priest and the how the Ark of the Covenant was actually housed in their in their house for some time while they were moving it around. So he was accustomed to the being in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. And okay. they put the Ark of the Covenant on a wagon with a mule and the ox stumbled. The Ark was about to fall down because the ox stumbled. And this uh this guy which I'll pop, I'll pop up his name here shortly. He, for To keep the Ark of the Covenant from falling, he braced it with his hands and touched it, and he died instantaneously, kind of like a shock. He was electrified and died instantaneously. That's fucked up. It's fucked up because he tried to help, yeah. but remember, he lost his reverence towards the Ark of the uh, Covenant. He First of all, why was it on the ox, and why was it being transported? God gives exact instructions on how to carry he wanted to be carried by four people and especially from the levite tribe and the priests he 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 has he gives exact instructions so after those levi pry or the priests and all those who would does he, does he give instructions of who can carry it now after and then after and then after you know <laughs> the instructions to carrying and transferring the ark remain the same it's just but i thought it was people i thought also the people yeah the priests are supposed to carry it only peace from the Levites oh, tribes, okay. from the descendants of Aaron, okay, Moses' okay, 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 brother, okay. can carry the Ark of the Covenant okay. on your. It's 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 meant to be borne on the shoulders of human to show the sacrifice and to show the reverence to God. This okay. this young man, by the name of by the name of Uzzah, by the name of Uzzah, uh, he touched it, lost his reverence for again. Why was it on the ox? Why mm-hmm. was the ox pulling it? And uh, he lost his reverence. So, rest in peace, Uza. Yeah. So here we have examples of how the ark could have been a weapon of mass destruction. Is it like a nuclear weapon? <laughs> Can't be right because they were holding it and then they walked. I'm trying to picture that in my head. Okay, they walked. I just the wall wait the walls of Jericho yeah mm-hmm. I mean, I'm trying to picture like I mean obviously it, it, I just I don't know how it would work it's the power of God there sure, is sure. I'll uh, let me bring up the Ark of the Covenant again so there is some scientists I I didn't get the story mm-hmm. one thing about the Ark of the Covenant. There is so much mystery surrounding it. We're probably going to talk about it again in relation to the mysteries surrounding it. But I just want to talk about it now as the backstory and what it is and what it can do and where it possibly is. And I want to take the mystery aspect out of it 
Mm. But what I'm about to say is in relation to the mystery aspect of it. Okay. There's some, there's a story of a, of a scientist that uh, this guy is a nuclear or an electrical engineer, some shit like that. Uh-huh. He, he put the Ark of the, of the Covenant, he, he put it in a software and this and that. And what, <laughs> what it came up to be is that it can be an electrical conductor. And uh-huh. the cherubim and in between there, that that could be where the uh, I, electricity I, I, flows and the spark. I see. Now, what creates the power of the ark, the tank, the the tablets, the staff, and the jar of mana? Again, it has powers. That's that's the battery. That's what creates the power, and the 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 energy that this produces is dispersed through between the two cherubim, where God speaks to His people. That's where it can be dispersed. Mm. So sometimes think of it in in Indiana Jones Raiders of the Lost Ark uh it they they give the ark of the covenant justice to be honest with you it's that they, first in Indiana Jones right first. yeah they they give it justice they they depict it very accurately and they also where they find it is 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 a possible place of where it could be at as well oh really mm mm-hmm. mhm damn George and, Lucas did a good job yeah but in there it shows the ark of the covenant striking people down via lightning rays or bolts or sometimes through invisible force just people just dropping dead and in the bible it also you know what let me let me uh read to you this verse here then he struck the men of beth shemesh which the inhabitants of beth shemesh are a large thriving city belonging to the canaanites now before Moses and his people left Mount Sinai and wandered the wilderness, God told Moses that he is going to give them the promised land, which the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, they were there. and the Perizzites, and the Hevites, and the Jebus, Jebusites, I probably butchered all these names, sorry guys, uh, are the current inhabitants of the promised land of Canaan. So they were going to go into conflict and battle these people to go to war, you know, the laws of war. To the spoils go the victor. To the I victor mean, goes the spoils. Sucks, but fucking man up. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so actually real quick, now knowing this, before the ark was constructed, these instructions were given to Moses. Maybe this is why God gave this powerful weapon to the Israelites to to benefit them, to help fulfill God's promise to the Israelites, and throughout their warfare and all this stuff, and the the Israelites carrying this ark around, that could possibly very well be why, uh, at the end of this of the of this book, the Israelites were able to conquer um, Jerusalem and and um, implemented the state of Israel. So, back to the story that I was saying, um, the Lord. Uh, then he struck the men of Beth Sebesh because they had looked upon into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. This was in first Sam in first Samuel uh, verse nine through 19. Now there are biblical commentators that think this number was just 70 people, not 50,070 people mm-hmm. that the, because they, they think that there was not that big of a thriving society, but that would be a enormous slaughter instantaneously. Now this happened because well, the backstory to this is because again, the Israelites and the Canaanites are in conflict. The Israelites were losing the battle. So they brought out the Ark of the Covenant to help be the decisive force in this battle. Of course, they did not have the permission of God so they lost the battle and they lost the Ark of the Covenant. The Canaanites were in possession of the Ark of the Covenant. They took it back to their hometown, to their towns, and they put it next to their idols, to their to their gods and their statues. And uh, and they put it, the Ark of the Covenant in that room. Uh, in the Bible, it shows that all their idols were, destruct- were destroyed. And then when the Canaanites looked into the Ark of the Covenant... Of course, this divine, this divine holy relic 
they all died on on impact they all had their their skin was melting they had boils which were like blister cataracts which is a it's form nuclear. of radiation sickness yeah. yes nuclear so it's crazy so could it be nuclear it's a possibility again when i was talking to you earlier about how i first started reading the bible to how i read it when i had faith to how i'm not reading it in a different lens um putting the picture more of what it could be in of what it was of the of what the stories were in modern day time yeah it could very well be right. a nuclear weapon i mean now that we have more knowledge of things mm -hmm. on another example of how the arc was used as possibly an energy weapon is in joshua three to five the priest with the ark stepped into the jordan river and it breaks before them uh the israelites went through two rivers actually well, they went through the red sea with moses and then joshua led his people into the promised land this is when they achieved the promised land crossing the jordan river the instructions god gave them was walk the, the priest walk through the river and the river will part will break in front of you and in the bible it says walk into the walk into the the river the jordan river and mists will appear mist will appear so like when they walk into it it mystifies it burns up mm -hmm. and it yeah yeah so could it be a weapon possibly hmm. oh look here's a picture of of them walking through the jordan river i don't know who drew this picture but it came up when i was doing my research fucking amazing huh that's crazy yeah now where is the ark of the covenant now again this is when we get into like the more mysterious facts like mm -hmm. there is there is a lot of areas where the ark of the covenant could possibly be uh could possibly be graham hancock went on a expedition to Ethiopia to see if the Ark of the Covenant is there. That's one of the possibilities of where it could be. But out of all the possibilities, which are a lot, three stood out to me in particular. But I have to go to the restroom. And we're back. All right. Uh, so, my friend... Hi, mamas. <laughs> so, Delilah, do you know where the Ark of the Covenant's at? I think she does. She just doesn't want to tell us. <laughs> so, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, who the fuck knows? But there is a lot of possibilities. Um, Some people think it's still there. Some people think it's in Ethiopia. Some people think aliens have it. Okay. Not for another discussion, not today. Oh, but or, you said three. I think we were we ended up on. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's three places or three things uh, out, stood out to you. Yeah, three places stood out to me, and one in particular is where I personally believe where it's at. But who the fuck am I? So a boob <laughs> or Bobby. So the first possibility is that the Ark of the Covenant is still somewhere in Jerusalem or in the Temple of Solomon or somewhere in Jerusalem. Because somewhere along in the timeline, um, fuck, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar went, I, I think he was uh, one of the kings of Babylon. He went into Jerusalem, uh, seized it, took all their riches and burned the city to the ground. And during these events, People believe that instead of transporting the Ark of the Covenant, they instead rather hid it in one of their tunnel systems. There is a lot of tunnel systems in in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, or sorry, there is a lot of tunnel systems in Jerusalem. Some have even been blocked off. And when somebody, somebody like in the 2000s went in to try to discover them, they were denied access to some of the tunnels there. So that's one theory that... Um, 
that the Jews hid it when King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylon and the Babylonians came into Jerusalem uh, and seized the, the and seized the palace. There is another theory um, that leads off of it that instead of hiding it still in Jerusalem, they instead took it in one of those tunnel systems that we we're talking about, mm-hmm. and they took it out and they dug it somewhere in the mountains. Uh, there is. There is, uh, fuck, what's his name? There's a guy that that investigated these areas, that these areas, and where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, somewhere in that region, he thinks that the Ark of the Covenant was hidden somewhere in that region. Mm-hmm. So that is possibility number one. Possibility number two is uh, the Ethiopians have it. This is, uh, Graham Hancock has a beautiful documentary revolving the stories around this, how uh, you guys can check him out and all that stuff. Uh, another quick quote, now that I'm giving Graham a, a shout out, um, The Y Files, it's a YouTube channel. He has a great story or a great uh, YouTube piece on the Ark of the Covenant. He covers more of the mystery side of, uh, mm-hmm. side of the things and like the the more of uh, he covers the Ark of the Covenant, but he also it's more of the you know the funner things to talk about with he talk aliens and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Check him out as well. All those uh, his channels pretty. Dope. Dope. I love like, it. Oh shit! What the fuck? So and he goes deep into it too. Yeah. So the story um, goes that uh, this Ethiopian woman, I believe she's a queen or a princess of sorts, comes to visit Solomon and his temple and wants to visit the Ark of the Covenant. Um, they end up having a relationship, I believe, uh, a secret child. She goes back to Ethiopia, doesn't tell nobody about this kid. Uh, this kid now, a man, comes back to, might be butchering the story, but it, I'm just wanting to go through it quickly. This kid now being a man comes back to Jerusalem uh, to visit King Solomon and to, uh, you know, to kind of just communicate, you know, I'm your son. And at this time, the people that came with this now a man from Ethiopia, a prince or whatever you want to call him, king maybe now, uh, the people that he came with actually took the Ark of the Covenant and replaced it with a decoy. And replaced it with a decoy. And when he got back to Ethiopia, he realized this. But because nothing bad happened to the Ark of the Covenant, he thought that it was the will of God that he wanted the Ethiopians to have have the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ethiopians have the oldest, the oldest record of the Bible. The Ethiopians have the oldest Bible known to man. And the Ethiopians had Christianity um, long before the Roman Catholics did long before the Europeans had it and all this stuff. So, um, now this Ethiopian young man, the son of Solomon, um, I believe. So he thought that it might have been the will of God that that he should have the Ark of the Covenant. So he didn't he didn't bring it back. And ever since then, there is a possibility that the Ark of the Covenant. Graham Hancock seems to think that. Um, that this place, this church, uh, f- the the Church of Mary of Zion, somewhere in Ethiopia, in this exact church is where the Ark of the Covenant is. Now, the thing about this is that this was built around something. And in order to take the Ark of the Covenant out of here, you would have to destroy the church because of the tunnel networks that it has. Now, there is another theory that mostly all churches in Ethiopia have a replica of the Ark of the Covenant just because just in case if somebody tries to take the Ark of the Covenant by force, mm-hmm. they wouldn't know where it's at or they would have to destroy all the churches in order to obtain the one true Ark of the Covenant. So that is another possibility. Another, ooh, there's four possibilities. Actually, no, there's these last two possibilities tie with e- within each other. Um, another possibility is that the Knight Templars hid it away. Um, 
as you know, the Knight, the Knight Templars would get a podcast of their own. But as you know, the Knight Templars were first established to uh, protect the pilgrimage of of Christianity going into Jerusalem. Um, so th they were established for that. And then eventually they gained a lot of power and they were used to, um, in some cases, topple nations and and monarchies in some cases. But they were an organization that was very interested in holy relics and stuff like that. Um, it is said that they also have the Holy Grail, the same Holy Grail that Jesus, um, when he was res resurrected, um, shared um, wine with his disciples. Another possibility is that now Knight Templars are Roman Catholic. The last possibility, which is my personal uh, my personal opinion on where the Ark of the Covenant is, is with the Roman Catholic Church in the Vatican. Why I think this is because in because in uh, oh I so I didn't put a date, but because at this time Rome, which um, Rome and the Jews don't have good history because the Jews were always rebellious towards Roman, the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire title um, put Titus in charge of um, of ending the Jew rebellion against the Roman rule, and Titus ended up seizing the land of Jerusalem and doing the same thing as King Nebuchadnezzar did. He went in there, took all of their riches, uh, and destroyed Jerusalem, burned it to the ground. Now, I am of the believer that the Roman Empire did not collapse, but instead shifted into the Roman Church because that is the last remaining evidence of a Roman Empire, which is the Roman Catholic Church. That is a bit of a conspiracy, and it is wild stuff going around it but it is a rabbit hole that i have yet to decipher to choose what side i am on on that conspiracy theory so put your tinfoil hat on for this particular topic i mean it would be uh <clears throat> without going into it or without like uh not going into it but without like knowing anything about it I mean, the Roman Empire was f fucking massive, fucking powerful, the most powerful ever. Just to collapse, I mean, I'm not saying that empires don't collapse, but mm -hmm. maybe they went, they tried to, you know, still yeah. become something, <clears throat> be something without. Yeah, and not only that, but the Roman Emperor Constantine was the one that converted Rome to Christianity in around 280. Uh, Anno Domino in the year of our no Anno Dom, I think Anno Domino is what AD stands for, but after Christ. Say that again. Anno Domino is, no, is uh, AD. He did what? Uh, Emperor Constantine was the one that converted to Christianity, and after that, basically most of Rome converted to Christianity as well. Mm. As to why, why it's called the Roman Catholic Church is I'm not sure. Again, that's mm -hmm. something that I'm still going into but this this is where i personally think is where it's at because as we know the vatican holds a lot of secrets and in their chambers which are 50 miles long in their secret archives maybe it's somewhere in there we do know that the churches already possess most of the holy relics the 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 crown of thorns which is in france yeah, Notre no, no, Notre Dame is the Catholic, or is oh it, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think they also have the Shroud of Jesus, don't they? The Shroud, which is where how when Jesus died and he was put into the cave, they put a shroud over him, and then mm. he rose, leaving only the shroud behind, which was an imprint of, of his, his face. face. No, the the, the holy face, or I uh, see that's in uh, Spain, I think. Mm. I but think still Catholic? Yeah, everything's Catholic. Okay. 
uh, or Brazil. <clears throat> I can't remember, but I know also the um, what is it? Uh, the Cup of Christ. They they believe that to be there's two there's two uh, st- places where they believe it to be. The Holy. And they're both in they're both in Spain. Mm. So <clears throat> there's a lot of mystery surrounding it. A lot of mystery surrounding that particular institute. Um, in general, he's not. We won't get into it now. But that's where I think it's at. That's where I think that now. It could very well be that it's nowhere. What I mean by that is, is the last time that the Bible was mentioned in the Bible, or the last time that it was seen. Sorry, the last time that it was seen in the Bible was at, um, during the timeline in the Bible when uh, Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon sieged Jerusalem. But it's not the last time that it was mentioned. The last time that it was mentioned was, I believe, in the book of Revelations, oh, which shit. is Armageddon. And it is said that the Ark of the Covenant will appear in the end times when the trumpets of war will be blown. The Ark of the Covenant will reveal itself, bringing down thunderstorms, hails, earthquakes, and destruction. Dang. That brings me chills. That gives me chills. So it is said that the Ark of the Covenant could possibly be divinely hidden and will not appear till then, till Armageddon. That's probably what's going to be. That's, that's all we're, we'll never know. And, and actually, I don't want to know in my lifetime. Because <laughs> so, if I know, then that's that's the yeah. end of the times. Yeah, but, it's it's a beautiful story. It's a, it's a beautiful story. But <clears throat> I, I did see something that People do think that the Ark of the Covenant did exist, though. Um, in particular, <clears throat> in particular, what what I've found from atheists, um, skeptics, biblical commentators, is that what, what you see is that we do have proof of the later stories in the Old Testament, like Solomon, uh, David, and all this stuff. Uh, it's the older stories, the Book of Noah, Abraham, um, Moses. That we can't find any That we evidence. can't necessarily find it. Now, there is some mysteries. I think I seen the other day surfing the web that there is remnants of war chariots somewhere in the somewhere in the Red Sea. There's remnants through LIDAR. We've seen that there's remnants of, of war chariots. It, could it be a possibility that those are the remnants of uh, Ramses when they were persecuting the Israelites? Possibility. Uh, which I think where we don't understand um, all these chariots or whatever were probably most, like, most likely wooden. And I think wooden or wood decays a lot. Yeah, wooden... It, it, with gold, though, gold oh. would be the remnants uh, or iron well, of well, how the wheels are well, made. Well, why I'm saying this, why I'm saying this is because it even goes back to like talking about ancient uh, civilizations or like ancient things where where uh, the structures mm-hmm. like people are like, oh, why isn't this or this and that? And a lot of the structures were built in, in wood and wood decays, right? Mm-hmm. Wood decays. So. So that's yeah. why that's why like we can't find this shit, you know, and yeah. uh, that goes back to you know understanding that how how Earth works and shit decays after yeah. fuck after you know thousands of years. Yeah, wood and a lot of uh, the ancient technology and the way they used to build things was, as the Bible said in the Book of Exodus, mud bricks. It's uh, what what it sounds like, you know, mud and hay and other components that would make the harden them in the sun or in ovens possibly and make mud bricks. Well, if you bury those up, I think they would just eventually decompose back to what their original properties were. But, but yeah, it's very or you know what? The other day, <clears throat> I I went to the landfill to dump some construction debris. And in the lamp on our local landfill here, yeah, yeah. You remember how it was just a big pile of dirt? Well, mm-hmm. now did you remember? So yeah, they're now digging a new one. Mm-hmm. Well, that's where it's at now, and they're now covering up what whatever 
we were filling it up with, with the old debris that was like 20 years ago. And it's all kind of fresh dirt now. The, the only sad thing that you can see is like little remnants of plastic bags that, that can't and shit. decay and stuff like that. Which going to the landfill makes me feel like a piece of oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> because it's so bad for our environment, but that's the way things are, I guess. And um, we need a trash planet. Yeah, yeah, so wood, wood, and all this stuff, and all these certain debris, bro, they decompose fast. Yeah. 20 years tops, probably less than that. We dig up two by four in our backyard, it'll probably be gone in five, 10 years. Like, yeah. Yeah, and I add. Uh, it goes back to, I can't remember what I was looking at. I was looking at stuff and people were, uh, oh, I went, like just kind of finding older civilizations and and, and structures. And mm-hmm. it's because of most likely it was wood and most likely it's, it's for sure gone. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, like I said, I don't think this will be the last time we'll talk about the Ark of the Covenant. There is, maybe next time we'll cover the mystery surrounding it, like the aliens. There's actually uh, footage. I'll note it real quickly. There's footage of of a of a UFO or of an orb hovering Jerusalem, possibly looking it, hovering Jerusalem in the last known place that the Ark was, possibly, and then it just shoots up. Hmm. The UFO, the orb just shoots up after it couldn't hmm. find something, or I don't know, but it was a flashing light, and then it just shoots up. There, there was something saying that it was some students. Some students m- made that footage, but the footage is from different angles. Same footage, different angles, like four or five different angles, different footages. Um, however, the the students that say that they made it, they never released the original digital file. They never released anything. So that's uh, another UFO similarities. But I was trying to see if I can find that video just to show it. I might be able to pull it up real quick. Is it this one? Yeah, that one right there. Oh. Uh, you, you, you'll see it. It's at night. Yeah, I said you just pull it up just there. To... Yeah? Well, what did you type UFO in Jerusalem? I just put orb Jerusalem. Arc. All right, fuck it. We'll look. Oh, look, 27 seconds. How's my volume? I hope it's not too loud. There's a new video. Proof we're not alone in the universe. A UFO in the form of a bright light is seen descending over the dome of the rock in Jerusalem. The video is said to be taken over the weekend. Uh, then suddenly the light shoots up into the sky. There you see it. Another oh, video from a different angle. See, different uh, appears angles. to show the light doing the same thing. Those clips have gone viral now. See? It's an orb, different huh. angles. Dang, that was 12 years ago. Yeah, 12 years ago. People say that it was, a, uh, students came out saying that it was them, something along those mm-hmm. lines. But again, they didn't release their, fi- it's the it's the typical UFO stories that you h- hear. Yeah. Can they be true? Yes. Are they probably false? Also, yes, but there's no evidence being released on either side of whether it's true or the side that's debunking it. You know, typical UFO stuff, actually. But that's pretty much all I got for the Ark of the Covenant for cool. today. Cool. And uh, I think we're 100% going to talk about. Uh, just relics, just old uh, mm. relics. I wanted to go into, you know, the crown of thorns and body of Christ, what actually and all that stuff. But now nah, we'll just wait for that. I'm bringing up another discussion. All right, guys, that's it for Intellects episode 006, the Ark of the Covenant. Until next time. Cool. Thank you, guys. Peace.